Oh, that's, nice. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> hey, everybody. I don't know who's watching. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I guess we could get started now. It's like five past. So I think if anybody else was going to join us, they would have by now. I can't tell if um, I don't know if I should, if I put on my phone, if I can see if anybody from Facebook joined, but. I don't know. We'll see. Well, either way, I'll be posting this to Facebook. So, <laughs> okay. All right. Now, um, welcome everybody to our inaugural episode of the Gen X Book Club. Uh, all right. I'll oh, got a notification, but it's not that. Okay. <laughs> all right. I'm Paul Stressner, and along with me is. Um, Del Railing, who's also host of the 80s at 8 on WEDM FM. And so long time, Appreciate long time it. podcast co host, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And um, joining us for the first time is um, an award winning author, winning the Pencraft Award mm -hmm. and an independent publisher book award with her debut novel, Once in a Lifetime. Oh, no. <laughs> no, wait, wait. Boom, it came in. <laughs> I came in? No, yeah, Suzanne Excellent. Mazzoni. The right one. <laughs> I even said my name correctly. Good job. <laughs> yeah, I, I meant to ask you for sure how you pronounce it, because I'm kind of a stickler with that, because mine's tricky, too. But <laughs> I think, I think well, all, of our, all of our last names are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's that's true. Well, mine's yeah. a mouthful, so. <laughs> but, you know, well, I'm used to it now. <laughs> well, this should be a lot of fun. I think this was a, a good um, book to pick. It was um, Bright Lights, Big City by Jay McInerney. It kind of like, um, kind of symbolizes the 80s a little bit with the, especially New York. And I got That's the book here. Well, pretty iconic. My, um, yeah. And, um. I also watched the movie. Oh, I didn't bring my Blu-ray in here today. I have but... the DVD. All right. <laughs> Library borrow DVD, yeah, but I have it. it. Wait, yeah. I have the... Uh -oh. Now, oh, wait. You got to go. I, I, I don't know if you can get the blur <laughs> out. But oh, this, yeah, that, that's the OG, the, man. <laughs> this is the original one from 1984. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wait, let me get rid of the blur in case we do any more of this stuff. It's easier to see it that way. Oh, yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> but it is very dog-eared and everything, so it's authentic. Oh, so you got it, so you got it when it first came out, huh? <laughs> yeah, I did. And then I also, um, I got it on Kindle so I could read it anywhere, in the, you know, on any device, what have you, for the update. But I did still have the original copy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, um, the first time, well, I had the book and I also played the um, the audio book too, so I was kind of like reading along. <laughs> that way when I first read it now I just read it again and I have I just read the book without the audio and I have notes here I got all kinds of stickers and everything. Oh, wow. <laughs> Paul did you read it did you read it originally back in 84 when it came no, out okay no, no I did not either this is the first time I've ever read it actually seen really? the movie but yeah yeah I wonder if it's a completely different experience because I did read I read it in like 1986 so mm -hmm. it had been out like a year or two and there was a big fuss over it but Oh, yeah, yeah. Lots of drugs. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. tell you some stories. <laughs> well, that's yeah. why we're here. <laughs> that, well, now we, I, no, are, you, um, are you from the, where are you from? Are you from the New York area? I grew up on Long Island. Okay. And this, <laughs> you know, now you picked the book, but <laughs> in 1986, I was working in Manhattan I was working, uh, it was like my first job out of school. Uh, I was working at Columbia Pictures. I was working in the legal department and the script research department. And my job was to check all the scripts uh -huh. to make sure that all the names, all the addresses, all the license plates, all everything that was mentioned in there was fictional so nobody could sue us. So it basically was the same job so, yeah. that, mm. that, you know, the Jay McInerney uh avatar character let's say <laughs> who they never even give him a name in the book if you no. notice yeah they never even give him a, a first name no um i had that exact same job at a similarly large company in new york city in the 80s 
And so uh, the things that he describes are, are pretty much what every young person was doing <laughs> in New York City in the 80s. The same clubs, the same bathroom stalls, the same, you know, the same <laughs> uh, activity that, you know, we weren't really supposed to be involved in. But <laughs> well, um, there, yeah, there he, were a lot of parallels. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if I wonder if um, Jay McInerney had the same job, too, you know, especially if you got it right on with that. I, don't know. Mm. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, I mean, some other things that I've read have pointed to a lot of things he said being autobiographical, mm -hmm. including being, you know, uh, I don't know how much, how much, uh, how many spoilers do we want to give people for, you know, a book that's been out for decades? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah think, here? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. Well, yeah. This is going to be all spoilers since, yeah. So we're going to talk about the book and everything. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so so read the book before. Um, I mean, you watch the movie too if you're interested in that <laughs> before listening. I did watch the movie. Did everybody? Did, did each of us watch the movie? Del, you said you watched mm -hmm. the movie. I did. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was surprised at how closely it followed the book. Paul and I were texting about that over the weekend, but uh, I was recognizing dialogue from the mm -hmm. movie that was exactly what was written in the book. So I, I don't have a, I haven't watched a, a ton of movies that I've read the books of, but I, I was, I was surprised at how closely this one followed the book, but they gave him an, they gave him a name in the movie. They so did. I guess, they I guess they, they sort of have to uh, kind of hard to, to follow the movie that way, but yeah, it, uh, um, I, 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 yeah, that's what, something I thought of at the end. I'm like, they ever named, they ever gave him a name in the book so it was just yeah. you it was a very uh unique point of view that he was writing with intense that he was using um at the time everything is you you think you're you know you think you're you can't see the you know the forest from the trees you think you think you'll never find your way home tonight or what it's always he's just you like he's lecturing himself or something but never even yeah. bothered to give himself a name yeah, I, I, I think I feel like the, the I've never read a book like that before. That was second person, other no. than like um, choose your own adventure or something. I feel like it's because the uh, the character is kind of unlikable. But if by using that second person, you're kind of like putting the reader in in their shoes, yeah. so you can relate better. I think I feel like it, that's what I'm assuming. <laughs> I don't know if that's the purpose, but that's what I feel like the reasoning behind that. It was very unique. I really liked it. Yeah, I thought of the choose your the choose your own adventure exactly. What you just said as I was reading yeah. it, and and I kind of felt like it was it was addressed like if I was in the character in the book, you know. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that was designed again to elicit sympathy or or what exactly. But mm -hmm. but Suzanne, like you said, maybe that's people that were from the East Coast could relate to that more, and that's the life that they wanted to lead or they were leading at the time. Who knows? We didn't. We didn't I live like of... that in, in Indiana, by the way. As far as, <laughs> as far as I, I'm sure, a little little different here in the Midwest. But uh... I don't know if I should apologize at this point. But that was kind of what everybody wanted to be doing out, you know, par partying and then living the good life. And uh, you know, the the uh, it was like a kind of a hangover left over from Studio Fifty Four, where people just would be out till all hours of the night. And you know, the bars didn't close in New York City till like four o'clock in the morning or something at the time, I think. So, and the uh, the the drinking age had only just recently gone up from eighteen to twenty one. I mean, people were uh, in New York. People were were sneaking out to bars when they were fourteen and fifteen mm -hmm. because the age was eighteen. And then, you know, it just creeped up like in the middle of the in the middle of the 80s, they changed it. So so I, I guess it was a little wilder than your average, you know, middle of the country kind of <laughs> lifestyle. I don't know. It's <laughs> But it's I felt in reading it and even with the tense that he used, like he was and you said he's kind of unlikable. I think he like had this a little bit of self loathing going on right. and right. was distancing himself like like he's watching some other character do this and right. doesn't even really want to like own up to this being him it's you it's this guy that right. can't get his act together and doesn't know how to live his life and you know he's screwing up and losing everything right. so and it was effective like you said it was unique I, I still don't think I've, I've read other books with that kind of point of view and 
it has to be really hard to keep that up and make it work. So that's probably why. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. You don't see um, novels like that. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe yesterday's, short, though. but right. Yeah. It wasn't even 200 pages, I don't think. But um, yeah, another interesting part, speaking of the character, the, they had like this um, side story going with the, the coma baby. And I think that kind of like yeah. related to him, you know, kind of like putting himself outside. Like I think it like represented him and kind of like being cut off from what's going on around him so. yeah i i remember at the time i think like andy warhol was a big deal and he mm -hmm. said something and it might even have been in, in relation to this book that you know people at the time were, were writing about going out and having all these experiences and you know bars and <clears throat> and what have you um but they were kind of writing about it as if they were anesthetized and just watching and not really invested emotionally in what was going on, which is kind of sad. But I think that was true. I think everybody felt like they wanted to do all these exciting things, but they weren't so much excited as just like completely burning themselves out. Yeah. So, yeah, I think you, I think you saw a lot of that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and even just like um, his writing, like with describing the city is uh, so perfect. Like my my dad grew up in Brooklyn, so I had ties to New York, so I've been to New York a ton, even um back then. So just the description of the speech, the <laughs> the, the um the people selling all the crap and everything. <laughs> um, yeah, that he actually yeah. buys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? I don't know. Why? Yeah. <laughs> he even knows that it's like the watch. I mean, he knows that it's not going right. to work or anything, but he buys it anyway. And <laughs> right. He knows all this This stuff fell off the back of a truck, but he lets himself mm -hmm. get talked into it anyway. It's. Yeah, yeah. I didn't remember if he did it have it in the book where he, he bought the ferret from the guy. <laughs> But he did in the movie, but I can't remember that part in the book, how he got the ferret to begin with. Yeah, he bought the ferret from some guy off the street, oh, I remember. Okay. But, okay. but I think the guy was selling like a ton of other things and he just was attracted to the ferret. ferret I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I tried, was there, were they, were they trying to make some kind of comparison there? Like, okay, it's the mascot for the the fact finding department, the fact checking department. Because like maybe they like ferret out the truth or whatever he was trying to say. Oh. I don't I was I was wondering, I think at one point, and maybe it was just in the movie, they were trying to make that comparison. And they said something like, well, that's why we have the, we're going to have a ferret as the mascot. So <laughs> that's a little bit because otherwise, like, first of all, who's selling a ferret in the middle of the street in New York City? Well, I'm sure it's who's been done. <laughs> and why would you buy it? I don't I don't get it. Uh, oh, I I made a note to it's like I'm related to this with the uh, umbrellas because I thought it was hilarious because I had the same exact thought one time because I it was like um in New York and then it then all of a sudden it started raining then out of nowhere tons of people were out selling umbrellas. <laughs> yeah, there was a Seinfeld episode like that, right? Where the umbrella salesmen were all oh, yeah, like competing so. with yeah, the yeah. and Jerry said that he used to be a umbrella salesman and he made up this you know like he would twirl the umbrella see nobody can see unless i <laughs> look at my hands up. he'd twirl the, the stem of the umbrella and it'd make the pattern go around with the you know the different right. colors on the rainbow and he was ticked off that the other umbrella salesman picked that up and started doing it as a sales technique <laughs> so they were all you know competing and once it started to rain then everybody was out selling the umbrellas so yeah yeah and i think somebody in our group um bought one and then like not even five minutes later like the the thing came flying off the umbrella, came flying <laughs> off the handle. Oh, no. <laughs> it's like, yeah, where do these people come from? <laughs> uh, yeah, and um, let's see, what other notes do I have? Let's see. Um, well, yeah, in the, in the movie, did we say his name was Jamie Conway? And I was actually getting nervous in the movie because they didn't say his name for a while. So then uh, I was thinking, oh, they're not going to give him a name. And then um, Clara said, oh, Mr. Conway. So then they said the last name, but then 
I didn't know if he was going to get a first name, but then eventually he did. So, <laughs> but yeah, see, it. I guess that would just be too hard to sustain in a movie, a character yeah. that mm -hmm. doesn't even have a name. That yeah. and I think people would just start calling him, you know, Michael, because it's Michael J. Fox, and he's very, you know, he's just like so recognizable. I think, I think might that might even have been a little bit of a drawback for me that. Michael J. Fox is in a movie. He's just, he's kind of Michael J. Fox and that's it. You know, yeah. you're not really, it was almost hard for me to picture him as a, as a screw up like this, you know? Yeah. And somebody forgot, would, what year did that come? I didn't write down what year that 80, came out. I think it was 88. Yeah. So that yeah. was like right prime um, family ties too. So that's like something like totally different character. Yeah. I went back but, and, yeah. and read read some of the reviews of the movie that were published back then and it was, most of them said he was he was um uh, miscast that, that like you know he he wasn't good for that role so um unfortunately i don't know how well the movie did but yeah yeah but yeah what did you I, think you think he was miscast or um i well i was trying to figure out why i hadn't watched the movie since 1988 and i think i think it was it, part of it was subject matter yes but then also i just that's not that's not and i i know he did casualties of war as well i didn't I, that's just not the type that. of roles that uh, that i like seeing him in i he's a comedy you know actor for me and so family ties back to the future um secret of my success doc hollywood like i love those movies so clearly i i don't feel that that's I, I like seeing him in in roles like this. It's it's just hard for me to watch. Yeah, and, and they did stick to the book pretty much. There were yeah. like a couple of differences towards the end, but um, yeah. So <laughs> it's not like they catered the they changed the role over, you know, to make it more him. They they kind of stuck to the script, so to speak. Yeah. If I, I think if I had never seen Michael J. Fox before and watched him in this role, I would have mm -hmm. been okay with it. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, he's a talented guy. He's very charismatic. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, good for any role. But like you're saying, just you have, kind of have a, a preconception of what you want that actor to be like. And I would agree. I don't think he really was the, you know, the bar fly addicted um just you know self abusing type that he, he's just too cute and you know boyish and <laughs> right yes yeah and, so too dark of a role i wanted to see somebody you know a little more rough and tumble with you know a five o'clock shadow and a little more hunched over not such nice hair maybe <laughs> not such nice feathered 80s hair you know um that's what i picture when i when i think to myself you know a down and out struggling writer even a young one Mm -hmm. so so that yeah i i kind of almost felt bad i wanted him to be <laughs> to, you want him to, to be successful you know but i didn't think that was this was the greatest uh um placement of you know the greatest casting job of his i saw casualties of war he was he was very good in that also <laughs> even that though he was like did anybody see it uh, in a long I, time i've seen that yeah, I don't think yeah. I've seen yeah, that. Yeah, I, I haven't seen it in ages either. But I, I sort of remember him being like the innocent guy who was being introduced to all these horrors mm -hmm. in yeah. war. And that even I could buy. Yeah. You know, a little easier than this. Agreed. And uh, so. Yeah, yeah, a little contrast. To Sorry, Michael, Sean wherever Penn. you are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no, no disrespect, of course. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, because he could act like even there was an episode that I saw kind of recently not family ties was like blew me away when um i think um one of his friends died in a car accident and he was supposed to be with them but he wasn't so then he was having all this guilt and yeah he had like this incredible monologue that you know kind of gets you choked up so wow. probably what one of those very special episodes <laughs> like, i was gonna yeah. say that. very special episode very special yeah. the family ties exactly yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> well suzanne you were you were um you mentioned earlier how the book would have maybe been different had I read it back when it was published. And I was actually thinking about that as I was reading it. And I, 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 I don't know, there was something about, I, I almost, there was some sympathy I felt toward the character as we were going through the book, because I just sort of felt like 
this is not, it's, I think he even says it in the beginning, this is not where he wants to be, or this is not who he wants to be. And I think it was that struggle throughout the book. I think if I wrote, would have read it when I would have, it would have come out or when it came out back in uh, 84, I probably would have just been, you know, it's just a druggy guy. Like it's just a book about drugs. It, it was just a different perspective that I had now. Maybe it's a maturity thing. I don't know, but, um, but I, I just sort of, you, you're wanting him to, to get out of this mess. Like you're, you're polling for him to do that. And it just keeps sabotaging his life. And, um, you know, so I was trying, I think I was look, reading it more as a, you know, trying to understand how he got there. And then when you find out that his mom had passed uh, the a year previously and his wife had left him and then he loses his job, like, it's just this, it's this progression of, of horrible things that happen in his life. And that's probably, you know, for a lot of people that, that have addiction issues, you know, I think sometimes we just, we just brush them aside and, and there's a story behind how they got to where they are. And that's kind of what I was looking at, you know, from that perspective when I was reading it. So I, I think, you know, 40 years ago, it would have been a different, different take on it than I had now. Yeah. Well, not only did his mother die, but I, under the assumption that like he helped her, like, did like an assisted suicide because she was in so much pain wasn't he like giving her um extra whatever hmm. it was she was taking they made but a reference to that but i i don't know did they say that he act they actually uh went through with that i think that i remember a reference either it was the book or the movie where the brothers had agreed had made a pact with her that they would yeah. And then you see he's talking to her at her bedside and he, she's in so much pain. And um, I don't I don't know that I ever made the leap that they actually did that because she kept saying, no, no, I want to be clear. I want to. Uh, yeah. I yeah, want yeah, the medicine offered, yet. yeah. He offered her morphine because she was having that scene and scene in the movie where she was in horrible pain and and she turns him down and then the pain goes away. So. Yeah. 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 I Maybe see. that's just kind of unspoken. They don't have to. So that people can't really judge him for that. Right. It's, it's sad. But you do feel mm -hmm. sympathy for him there. You yeah. just, yeah. even if feeling sympathy, you're wishing that he would find some healthier way to deal with all these things right. that are in front of him, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And um, that Allagash, Tad Allagash, he wasn't a very good influence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that, that didn't help. But... Oh, speaking of that, Kiefer Sutherland played him. I, I could picture maybe him playing Jamie and then maybe James Spader playing Allagash. <laughs> I bet that would be <laughs> that, that might have been better casting. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's that's not bad. That's not uh -huh. bad. I think Ted Allagash was based on a real guy. And I think uh -huh. I looked it up at one point, and he actually looks like Kiefer, Kiefer Sutherland does in that film. Oh, really? So maybe that's why he got the job. <laughs> but yeah, it's true. Both of those guys, James Spader and and uh, um, Kiefer Sutherland, are uh, pretty much you know your '80s bad guys. You know, leading people off into sin and vampirism. <laughs> <laughs> he was excellent in, in Lost Boys. But... <laughs> uh, we we just had a podcast on Lost Boys around Halloween, and oh, yeah? Uh, yeah, so I was. Uh, I got outed. I wasn't a fan of the movie, so I was try I was trying to play it off, but they they outed me. So, and, uh, but yeah. So, but I, I I didn't didn't really care for Kiefer Sutherland's character in Lost Boys or, or in this movie. Oh boy, yeah. And um, Claire, one of our co-hosts, um, we did our '80s crushes, and she had a crush on um, on David in Lost Boys, not Kiefer Sutherland, <laughs> the actual the character David. David. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see oh that phoebe cates played amanda in this that was that yeah was i don't know that she was very well cast either because she was supposed no. to be this blonde farm girl from kansas who then steps into the million new york city and she was instead just kind of you know pixie haired phoebe cates who everybody knows from fast times you know so yeah. i don't know that that was the best no. choice for that character either no, you know what? When I saw the, the the movie poster, I saw that she was in it. When I was reading the book, I was picturing her as um uh, Meg. Is it Meg that's in the office? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I thought I thought she'd be Meg, but yeah, no, she was Amanda. It's Woozy Kurtz um <laughs> played Meg, which I didn't 
picture that either. <laughs> um, I would agree. Casting was not the greatest. It's kind of strange because they did, like we said, they used the dialogue almost verbatim in a mm -hmm. lot of the scenes. Yeah. But yet you didn't really get the same feeling watching it as you did reading it. You know, mm -hmm. I thought it was a, a, a different vibe. Like you're watching the same story, but it just had, it just did not have that same um, level. And it, it didn't like draw you in quite as much as the writing did. And I think that's like probably the biggest problem in trying to make a movie of a popular book, especially if one that has like a cool, strong voice. I think that was a problem with a lot of the early Stephen King books where you read it and it's just such a cool experience because he's so good at writing it and you're in his head, you know? And when you put that on the screen, you're just, you're not hearing that voice quite the same way. They even, they tried to do a lot of narration from the very beginning of the book. Right. But I don't think it quite was able to reproduce the same feeling of desperation, you know, that was kind of throughout this whole film. I mean, through, throughout the whole book. It seemed like a very quick turnaround too, because I, again, I have nothing to base this on, but you know, the book was 84, the movie was 88. It's usually, I, I, my experience or what I remember is books that came out 10 years ago are made into movies or longer than that. So mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know if it was just, Hey, this is an, you know, this is an eighties vibe and the decades coming to an end. We got to get this on screen, but it seemed to be very quick. And the, the actors, you know, everybody in that movie, the, the main actors were, were super popular at the time. So I wonder if that was part of the reason for the casting was, you know, let's, let's get these, these folks out there. Um, you know, they're big right now, big names, you know, yeah, hopefully that will carry it. Yep, People go to yep. see them. Yeah. 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 So that could have been part of it. But but you had you had some uh, like Jason Robards was in the movie. And oh, yeah. uh, John Houseman mm -hmm. was was in the So some some, you know, very established actors were in, in this movie, not in huge roles. But um, so, you know, they, I think they really tried to to make it a big hit. But I just think the subject matter. Uh, I think that's, like I said, that's what did it for me. That's why I, it was a one and done pretty much for me. I watched it and I'm good. Yeah. See, back, back then <laughs> at that age, I, I probably wouldn't have liked that because it wasn't um, science fiction and comedy. Right. It, wasn't, well, it wasn't a shoot em up and I wasn't really like intellectual back then. So. <laughs> um, well, well, they talked about, uh, I, I again, reading some of the the material that was published back then, um, not not being an avid reader back in the mid '80s, but I guess that there was they, they had a brat pack of writers, including Jay, along with two others. They said who wrote um, books on this subject matter, and so it, you know not only did you have the brat pack in the movies, but then you also had it in in print as well. So um, so I, I obviously missed out on that, but um, I don't know if you've saw that or knew of like lesson zero i think was included right. in that so uh yeah i i remember there was kind of a wave of young people who were writing books like i said this is probably what um what andy warhol was commenting on so yeah brady brady Sinellis, who wrote less than zero um he came out with a couple of books around that time there was uh there was a writer named tama janowitz um who wrote slaves of new york i think it was called and that was another, you know, New York artist trying to, you know, starving, trying to make it. Um, and uh, yeah, see, nobody talks about Tama Janowitz anymore. That was a, that was an interesting book. It was an interesting book, too. But they were all kind of short, succinct um, characters who were just willing to kind of debase themselves to a certain degree to be part of this, you know, subculture of, of artsy people in New York. And um, yeah, so I, I guess it kind of was, and that was all kind of being glorified by, you know, the part interview magazine and Vanity Fair and all that, all that kind of stuff. It was all one, uh, one big culture. Um, Brady Snellis, I think was more a California type though. That took place in Los Angeles, right? It was okay. kind of like, um, and he went off to college in Vermont or someplace, uh, you know, on the, um, on the East coast. Um, and then went home to Los Angeles and saw it in a whole different, light as far as you know all those rich uh young people that he grew up with that were completely just aimless and didn't know what to do with themselves 
because they already had everything that they would ever, you know, need. You know, their parents were wealthy beyond belief, but yet didn't pay the least bit of attention to what was going on in their lives. So that was another kind of cool topic that, you know, that was being brought to life. So I yeah, mentioned, I, I, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Paul, I was going to say, I mentioned that I, I sort of felt sympathy at times for the character. It, it I, I'm not pick, I didn't pick up that from the two of you. What, what, how did you feel as you read the book about the, the main character? Um, I, well, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, oh yeah. It was like one of those things where I like, felt like frustrated and I felt bad because he was constantly making the wrong decisions. But then as you go along, you, you find out why that was happening between his wife leaving and um, yeah. And then his mom and everything. And like, even like his, his brother was like, like implying that he didn't even care, but you know, obviously he did because it was coming up the year and that's why the brother was in town trying to get him to go home with his father you know for the year anniversary and yeah and he kind of like had a breakdown so obviously he was holding everything in so yeah yeah he literally ran from his brother <laughs> ran away from him <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when he saw him <laughs> on his stoop uh uh, I in the end I felt sympathy for him. I of course you have to feel sympathy for him when you see what he went through with his with his mother. Uh but through most uh in reading most of the book, I mean I, I felt I don't know, I related a lot to the character because like I said, I had kind of a similar job. I had, you know, I had um I had a uh an English degree. I was looking to be a writer. Um, and I was in a job that was very similar and sounded really, really exciting, but sort of like what he depicted was actually really, really boring. <laughs> you know, just really just just sitting in an office with, and there were no computers at the time to look this stuff up. You had a closet full of textbooks, encyclopedias and trademark books and association books and phone books from every city in the world. And basically that was your day, was staring at those books and looking things up, you know, maybe getting on the phone with a Rolodex full of people, you know, asking, is there a cop named, you know, Bretton Williams on the Boston Police Department, please <laughs> verify for me. Um, and then, you know, a writer strike comes along and then you have nothing because there's no scripts. So you're just oh, kind of sitting there looking at walls and, you know, that are this big in an office in, in Manhattan. Um, so I, I related a lot. I felt a certain amount of sympathy with his, particular situation but just from my own personal point of view jay mcinerney went on to be a very famous author <laughs> and by the time i read the book he already was you know the toast of the town so there was a certain part of me that was not sympathetic at all and was like damn it <laughs> <laughs> you know like that's all you have to do <laughs> so i don't know i had a complex conflicting feelings <laughs> at yeah. the time yep yeah. And even like um his co-workers there, they were like ready to stand up for him and everything too. And he, he wouldn't fight like getting fired. And, but you know, if he was really that bad of a slacker, you would <laughs> think that they'd be saying see ya to him. But they were, you know, taking his side and felt that, you know, Clara was like a little too aggressive there and seemed like she did want him out and yeah, and he did seem to uh, be set up for failure having to do that research at the last minute for a place true. in France that's like a different time zone when their offices were closing and everything. And yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. But he did lie. You know, he made he made mention of the fact that he lied about being able to speak French and right. You know, from the outset. But I think that kind of gives you a clue: the fact that yeah, his coworkers were on his side. So maybe he wasn't such a jerk all the time or you know the whole time and they knew that he was sliding you know because of circumstances in his life because mm -hmm. otherwise maybe they'd be gunning for him to be out the door you know right. especially in a prestigious magazine like that yeah. you know then maybe they would have been um more at each other's throats and you know meg in particular was seemed to be trying to reach out to him from the start to say hey 
what's wrong? Do you need some help? I'll help you with this. I'll help you with that. And he just, you know, blew her off until the very end there. So. Yeah. But, um, yeah, he seems to hit it off with um, Vicky, Tad's cousin. And then I was surprised to find out that was um, Tracy Powell and that was playing her in the movie. So. <laughs> Yeah, that, yeah, that was that's true. That. that was pretty cool. A real married couple. I don't know if they were. Were they married at that point? Maybe. I don't were know they? they got married. I don't know. Might have been around they, the they, time. Did anybody yeah. time that out? No, they they met it on Family Ties, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. I think they. I think by then they had already been together on Family Ties. Like I didn't watch a lot of TV in the eighties. I was more a music person, uh, so I didn't watch a lot of Family Ties. But I think I remember hearing that they were a couple. I don't know if they were married yet around that time. Some yeah. things are a little bit of a blur. <laughs> <laughs> that crazy New York life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and then like, there were like some of the difference, like a little subtle one was when his brother was there uh, like i made a note that like you know after they were like kind of hashed out the problems and then um the narrator in the book um or jamie in the movie he asked them if he if michael if he wanted to do a few lines with them but then the movie the the michael said no but in the in the book he did so it's like some differences yeah. And, and then, like the the big one at the end was with the um, with the way he left like Tad there, like telling him that him and Amanda would be good together or something like that. When in the book, it was nothing like that. Didn't he allude? Yeah, to... in the book, didn't he kind of just like freak out and they had to, you know, he was almost like having a fit on the floor that they had to drag him out of there or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, I mean, asked how he was doing. <laughs> it's like, how am I doing? And it was yeah, and kind of as if nothing it. was going on, and you know, yeah, came up to them like, oh, my best friends, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then, once again, I think they tried to get there in the film, but they didn't really commit to it, you know. Yeah, but he comes. He comes with the realization that his wife is not what he thought she was. I forget how he describes it, but it's plastic or something like that. But you know the the symbolic of that mannequin. But I think that he realizes that that's you know, good. I'm, I'm not missing. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not missing out on what I thought I was missing out on here. And I think that's when things start to change for him. Just a thought. Yeah, yeah, because he realizes that she was like using him to get to New York, get out of Kansas. And... Yeah. Yeah, New York. and then he starts to mourn his mom, and mm -hmm. that's where things start changing. We think, yeah. anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With any yeah. luck, poor guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, he reached out to Vicky. Yeah, they did, did seem good together. Him and Vicky. So. Yeah, well, she seemed a lot more like a real person, not mm -hmm. you know one of these glitterati types that you know he'd been hanging around with. Which I guess it it makes sense that. Uh, you could say, well, you know, Tad and Amanda would probably be a better couple. <laughs> Not that, you know, because Tad was like, I never liked her. She was, didn't she? He said she was a fake mm -hmm. too. Even he said, yeah. you know, she was a fake and you were her meal ticket. Mm -hmm. So at least he was on to her, you know, I'm sure long before Jamie was, who's, you know, like I said, he's not even Jamie in the in the book, but, um, you know, so you have to give him a little credit for that. He's not so fake that he bought into that. Um, but and to me, it sounded more like he wasn't so much fake as rich and jaded. You know, you could tell that he just was able to get whatever the hell he wanted at the, you know, the drop of a hat. Um, and he must have had a pretty darn good job, too, in advertising, because, you know, all he had to do is go to his friend and say, hey, I need a ticket to the Oscar, Oscar de la Renta fashion show. Uh, you know, he just happens to have that access to that. So, <laughs> um. But yeah, so in the end, even, and Vicky being related to him, you know, you you kind of seeing that, you know, there's there's some there's some redemption there for the Allagash family. You know, they're not all just um, you know jaded partiers. Uh, so she she seemed like a much more sincere person and somebody that he can actually confide in on what was going on with him. So 
Yeah, yeah, it seemed like, um, yeah, her and maybe Meg were like the most, um, you know, like the best characters, like, um, realistic down to earth or whatever. Yeah, yeah, most decent characters, maybe. <laughs> And probably a support system for him if the if the storyline would have continued. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't I don't want to jump to the end, but I I have a question about the end that I wanted yeah. to ask. I don't I don't know if that was a good time or not, but okay. Yeah. So the so the bread deal at the end. What what was what do you interpret that as exactly? Because he exchanges his sunglasses right for bread, mm -hmm. and so what is that bread symbolic? of uh, hmm. I, I is there a meaning but i don't know i'm just asking i, 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 just, I, trying to I figure think that, that out. was better done in the book too he talked a lot in the very beginning of the book and then again at the end of the book that when uh when they were first married when when uh um they lived in a, in a small apartment. They had just gotten to New York. They would keep the windows open because it was too hot. So maybe they didn't even have, you know, air conditioning. Um, and, and every morning they would wake up and they would be able to smell the bread from the bakeries that were downstairs. And that was comforting. And he'd go get her croissants and, you know, they were newlyweds and everything mm -hmm. looked like it was going to be great. So I think that that smell of bread and that, you know, fresh morning where you wake up and you think, gee, it's going to be a nice life. I think in his head, that's what that meant to him to have that nice fresh bread. And it was a, you know, it, it was a new start. And so he ends up just kind of wandering around the docks at, at sunrise yeah. and, uh, you know, finding the bread truck because they're off, you know, delivering really early in the morning and just feels like I've got to, I've got to have it. You know, I've got to like bring myself back to that point in my life where I can start fresh again. Um, uh, I think that's the point they were trying to make. Once again, I think he spelled it out a little bit in the, in the book. The the end of the movie, I don't know, it just wasn't, it didn't really resonate as much. It's just kind of like him sitting have, have sitting down and, you know, eating and big deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I might have missed it in the in the book, but in the movie, his it actually, there's a scene where they flash back and his mom is baking loaves of bread. So I, I don't okay, know if that yeah. was their connection, but I, I don't remember that. I didn't go back and look and see if I missed it in the book, but, um, and, and, and I, I, I even thought like, okay, he's turning in his sunglasses, the bright lights, he's done with that. And I, I don't know yeah. who knows, but <laughs> is the bread communion? I mean, I, I was, I was going everywhere with that, trying to figure it out. Cause the, the ending just, you know, I, I I'm like, okay, what does this mean? So yeah, like, yeah, I think it is, like, kind of like a fresh start. Like, he's going back to that place, but now he's, like, starting over again. Hopefully, you know, going in a better direction this time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the the last line of the book, I think, or one of the last lines. I'll have to learn everything all over again. Right, yeah. So, and is that is interesting that he gives away the, the sunglasses, which um, I think he even says, hey, they're really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah <laughs> here take them you know they're kind of like he's casting off that well it's good because it's shiny and 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 it costs a lot of money and this is new york and that's what we do and taking around i don't want it anymore uh once again here it is it's he's been up all night michael j fox has been <laughs> let's say has been up all night partying distraught over his wife you know making like he's just practically you know a, a stranger at this party starting his life all over again but yet he still looks calmed out and nice and mm -hmm. you know like i was saying to myself you know he's at rock bottom now and he's trying to turn his he want, he's at the point where he's realizing he has to turn things around why is he not more disheveled come on <laughs> right. it's yeah. just too hollywood and nice and he just is too cute well and to, part of the issue at is that I, point yeah when i was reading the book i was picturing michael j fox as this character and not somebody who like you read it before you saw the movie you probably had That's a different different vision of what that character looked like so yeah i i it was mm -hmm. it was hard it was harder to read the book i think having that mental image of that character um already set so But yeah, I agree. I would have liked to have seen someone who looked a little more messed up, I guess.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, Uh, I think I don't know that it would play today. Like people would get to the end of that film and say, what? What's happened? mm What? (laughs) He sees he's eating a loaf of bread. What is that? (laughs) You know, like it's just not enough of a of a solid moment of <laughs> something yeah. you know big is a big change is coming now yeah. but um i think maybe that at the time period you were able to be a little bit more subtle you know people didn't need things just kind of like slammed in their face so like okay now you know it's over <laughs> now you know this is the end <laughs> yeah yeah leave some to the imagination well, well, even like at the beginning of the the movie, they kind of like explained everything, but then it seemed to like fizzle out at the end. They didn't weren't doing that at the end. <laughs> I don't know. Hmm. Uh, I guess um, it'd be it'd be a whole new new world. But I don't know that you, you couldn't make this movie today. Just too much stuff going on that would be you know thrown out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah. it was a different world. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. I don't think any of that would be like that. It'll be something different at this time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I think that's why it's a good sub. It's good subject matter for us because right. you know we can remember the time period and kind of what that kind of allure of the you know bright lights, big city did to people. So I don't know. How much different is New York City now? I don't know. <laughs> like, I didn't stay very long, I'll be honest with you, because that that atmosphere kind of drives you crazy. And after a while, I was like, okay, I'm going back to Long Island. I <laughs> and then I left Long Island and went to Pennsylvania, where, which is where I went to college. Um, but it's it's tough, especially if you don't have all those resources where, you know, you have money, you have parents who have money, you can, you know, afford to get a car to take you everywhere and you know (laughs) you know it's it's that much harder if you're not that person you know if you're if you're struggling financially so uh i don't know i don't really know what the experience is in 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 new york city right now it's it's probably a whole different world so yeah yeah um yeah, if I lived there, I'd probably be dead by now. <laughs> I would never sleep. I'd be. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I, I, it's it's a real possibility so, that you know so you really screw do. yourself up if you stay mm-hmm. there. Is the thing because mm-hmm. I I sort of had my own you know Tad Allegashi friend who dragged me everywhere, and <laughs> you know after a while I I had to say okay I can't even I can't even keep up this friendship because bad things happen. You know like. You kind of, I kind of felt a lot of times like I would go out and do all these cool things, but I was always really physically risking my life in some way. You know, I was ending, ended up in a car, driving home in a car with somebody who had been drinking or, you know, walking across a bridge, you know, in the middle of the night, it, you know, like we would do things that just were stupid <laughs> just <laughs> because people just did crazy things, you know? And I, a- after a while, you have to say, okay, I can't put myself, I, I have to grow up now. I can't put myself in jeopardy like this anymore. <laughs> Especially that, you know, the city was a little rougher then. Like I was just Sorry. in a, I hope I'm not talking too much, but no. No. I was in, uh, I was in New York last night because it's Broadway week. You know, there's like three weeks, but um, I went to, uh, to the city and saw spam a lot with my sister-in-law and uh, some other family brought my son, etc. We walked through, through Times Square and Times Square now is people dressed up like Mickey Mouse standing around. Even the, we were there, you know, late at night. And there was still, you know, there's still Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse standing there, you know, waiting for tourists so they can, you know, take pictures and put your put your arm around them and give them five bucks. And, uh, you know, it's very, and there's a Disney store and there's the M&M store and there's, you know, the, uh, well, F.A.O. Schwartz was was uh, there when I, were, uh, I guess when I, um, when I was there and that's a, that's a kid's store, but it wasn't quite Times Square, but it's like very like sanitized, tourist you know and it it wasn't at the time it was it was rough it was you know it was physically um intimidating for a a woman you know to be in the city especially in times square um at night and getting around um getting around the city in fact i was like (laughs) showing my son oh wait i recognize this neighborhood i got mugged here (laughs) you know yeah there's (laughs) 
It's like, oh, mom, tell me about that. Jeez. <laughs> wow. It's like, oh, it's don't tell mama. Yeah, I went to sing there. Yeah, wait, wait. I got robbed that day too. <laughs> It was bad. So I'm not gonna kill I'm not gonna kid you. It was bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a there's a scene in the movie, I don't know if it was in the book as well, but they at the at the, toward the beginning, the club is closing. And I don't know what time it is, three yeah. or four or something like that. And and they say we'll open again tomorrow night at eleven. Right. And I was like, that has to be PM. Like they're not even opening until eleven PM. The yeah. club yeah. isn't so you don't like go out and... <laughs> Yeah. And then I'm like, okay, well then how long do you stay after that? And then you gotta work the next day and like like it seems like you would just get burned out on that lifestyle so quickly. Yeah. And my grandmother always yeah. said nothing not nothing good happens after midnight. So <laughs> um, you know, you get an yeah, hour and then you gotta go York. home. But that's yeah. Hmm. Not in New York. I, yeah, I had yeah. a <laughs> I had a, a friend uh he was in a band and he I had found out that he was um opening for um there was a band called the tubes in the 80s. Oh yeah. And um they were playing at um the Texas Lone Star Cafe, which was kind of a nice, uh kind of a decent venue. Um so I went uh we went down there to kind of you know surprise him and say hi and it, after the show they were kind of packing up. Um, and it was, it was, it was late. It was like, you know, 11 o'clock and we kind of said, well, come on, let's go out now. And he, he, not being from New York, he looked at me like, uh, I, it's 11 o'clock. <laughs> Are you nuts? And we just kind of left, like, we never go out early. <laughs> this is when we go out. He said, you're in New York now. <laughs> this is when we go out. <laughs> yeah. If you go earlier, it's, everything's it's empty. Yeah. 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 <laughs> It's like, shock. Yeah. yeah. Jamie Lee Curtis has to be in bed by nine o'clock. So she would not fit in into New York or the, the scene yeah, there. So, well, well now I kind of, you know, I kind of feel the same way. It's like, yeah, that's a really good idea. Right. Didn't she say, well, why don't they do, you know, matinee concerts and yeah, <laughs> yeah, play yeah, exactly. in the afternoon? <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Things change as you get older, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. That would be great now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if there's like anything else that uh, want to cover with this. No, I thought it, I thought it was a good book. Haven't read it the yeah. first time, and glad you uh, recommended it. And so, got to learn a little bit about the New York life uh, li lifestyle yeah. back in the uh, early eighties. Very, very nostalgic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's almost like um, New York was like a character in the book too. So, the, true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's yeah, true. It described it really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, that is the name of Bright Lights, Big City. So, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. It was very effective in that regard. It was very, um, you know, the way he was like he was being hit up by. Uh, you know, panhandlers, and he was, mm. you know, fighting to get into the subway before the door closed on the car, and just, just all these peripheral things that go on around you in the city that you kind of have to tune out, um, or that you know it'll make you crazy. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that's the thing. I think he started to tune out just everything. You know, and just wasn't attached to, just to, detached from everything. So there was just too much that was not working in his life. Yeah. Yeah. So I wonder if he turned his life around. It should be a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that never happened, huh? Or did he get a sequel? I don't know. I didn't really pay attention to that part. That's a good question. I don't know. Yeah. I yeah, maybe we should look. I know he wrote, I know Jay McInerney wrote a lot of other books. And mm -hmm. in just like, I kind of perused through on the, on the internet to see when, you know, what else he wrote and a couple of other books had bright in the title. So I'm wondering if, if there was a sequel, I, I would, mm. I would think I would have heard about it, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, maybe I just kind of fell off of that train. <laughs> yeah, uh, something worth looking into. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, I'll announce our book for next month will be 
Waxing on. <laughs> Love <laughs> it. <Ralph> Macho. <laughs> the Karate Ooh, Kid. Great title. Me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, when I, I think that just came out, was it last year? It was either last year or the year yeah. before when it came out. It was out last and, year. Yep. Yeah. And I thought it was just like a memoir about him, but it's like specifically about his time with the Karate Kids. So uh, that should be really interesting. <laughs> As our friend uh, Lizzie would say, he's uh, probably spilling the tea. So. <laughs> <laughs> so that should be good. And revisit that movie and get ready for, is it the final season of Cobra Kai coming out? Final season of Cobra summer? Kai and the new Karate Kid ah. movie that's supposed to be out in December. Oh. So I this is. Watch. I haven't seen, haven't seen Cobra Kai. I've got to watch that now. <laughs> Suppose, supposedly this movie is going to have Ralph Macchio and Jackie Chan in it. So somehow they're going to tie uh mm -hmm. the the new the latest karate kid movie and the original together so we'll see oh interesting. yeah 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 oh yeah you should check out that cobra kai suzanne that's really it's really awesome good. yeah yeah i thought it was I gonna be it. yeah i thought it was gonna be really cheesy and it it from the beginning the first episode it was like this is really good so yeah, yeah check, check it, it out, out. Yeah, i have an lots. assignment now there you go <laughs> and, and uh, i have been I actually haven't seen the Karate Kid yet since I watched Cobra Kai, and I'll be like watching it with the whole new light this time. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, there are cool. lots of tie-ins with the the at least the first three movies into the Cobra Kai series. Yeah, yeah. Well, I heard that um, Hillary Swank's going to be in the next season too. So. I've been hearing that. I've been hearing that for the beginning. So we'll, uh, we'll see. Yeah. 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 Although <laughs> they said, there, I never was, saw that one either. It was the next Karate Kid. Yeah, I haven't it was, seen that. It was okay. But yeah, there was, there was that rumor for uh, right, right when this uh, series started that uh, Elizabeth Shue was going to be on and then she didn't show and didn't show and, didn't, and she finally did. Hmm. So maybe there's something to the Hillary Swank rumors. <laughs> How many seasons? How many seasons are there of Cobra Kai? I, I think this is going to be season six coming up. Yeah, that sounds right. Wow. All right, so I got to put some yeah. time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you won't put some time it. aside for that one. Oh, oh, it, okay. it goes it goes really fast. I think when they like half hour episodes, I think they're like they're not, and it okay. flies right through. Yeah, you can. Yeah, I've heard good things. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it goes by fast. Yeah, it's really well done, and it it really it, it really like does like fan service for us, but the in those at the same time, it's good for like the younger people mm -hmm. too. So yeah, they do a really good job of you know, gelling it all together. It's really good. Yeah. They do a good job. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. So I'm I'll looking see. forward to this book too. <laughs> <laughs> Much longer than Bright Lights, Big City. Yes. I noticed. Yeah. <laughs> I, like I blew yeah. through Bright Lights, Big City. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I better, I better start tomorrow just to give myself enough time. This one was, yeah. uh, was a little challenging i started a little late yeah. but i got through it but yeah this one's gonna take a little more time yes yeah, 241 pages oh boy okay but well well it's not it's not tall though the book that i have so i don't know it might be fast reading so okay we'll see yeah it should be okay. oh, it's, a, it's, it's a shorter month though too so <laughs> oh yeah that's well, true well, with an extra day <laughs> well, right, yeah, yeah, barely. yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. Although we're probably Don't not going to beat on the, on the 29th. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> just let us know what the date is. Yeah. Yeah. We'll figure it out. Yeah. We'll try to do the record these on like the Sundays, like the last Sunday of the month, I think. That seems. Sounds good. good. Yeah. And hopefully yeah. We'll get that'll work for me. <laughs> awesome. So before we sign off, you want to promote your stuff? We'll start with you, Dell. Sure. Uh, the radio shows the 80s at 8 on uh, WEDM. You can download the WEDM app, uh, probably the easiest way to get the show. Um, app is free, uh, 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Saturdays and Sundays. And then next next weekend, next Sunday, is the Grammy Awards. So it'll be our annual Grammy uh, award-winning weekend. So we're playing mm -hmm. nothing but Grammy award winners from the 80s. So probably the the my my second favorite next to the Academy Awards uh, weekend where we uh, play nothing but soundtrack music. But probably the best of the best music will be played next weekend from, from the eighties. So hope, hopefully everybody can tune in. Love that. Oh, and there's like some special um, internet magic going on right now because you're on the air at two places at once. The show's on right now as we're yeah. speaking. Yeah. Uh, the magic of technology. Nice. Yeah. Hang on. I, I got to cut in right now real quick. Hang on just a minute. Okay. <laughs> 
No, we won't. We won't talk about how that happens. But yeah, I am on the air right now. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> In case there's anybody watching on Facebook, I can't tell if anybody was on Facebook. If you are, thank you so much. Yeah, I kept. I, I kept. Uh, yeah, I kept looking uh, at the clock, going, "Okay, it's seven fifty-eight. Okay, what, 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 yeah, okay, well, that's all right. Like I said, technology is my friend." <laughs> Suzanne, how can people get a hold of you? Let's hear about uh, your book. Okay. Yeah. Um. Uh, I oh, why don't you the... Why don't you um do describe your book because I think people that are listening to this will be really into that. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, that's true. Well, here's once in a lifetime. We're actually doing a relaunch, so there might be a, a new cover coming up, uh, very purple. But in any case, yeah. it uh, takes place in 1984, which is actually the same. You know, the same Ooh. year. <laughs> and it's kind of um, a coming of age story, an artsy student looking to kind of kickstart start her life and, uh, you know, get out there and make things happen for herself. Uh, and it's uh, kind of uh, plays out all on uh, a background of like new wave music and, and art and, um, you know, a lot of uh, fun, like uh, female friendships and love triangles and that kind of thing going on. So you can take a look at uh, once in a lifetime novel.com or Suzanne Mataboni.com. So that's um, S U Z A N N E M A T T A B O N I have to spell it for everybody. So, you know, <laughs> but you know, lots of eighties nostalgia, much, much more fun than, <laughs> than what was going on in New York city. It actually takes place in uh, New Hope, Pennsylvania, which is uh, you know, kind of a crazy tourist town uh, with a lot of very, you know, artsy progressive types um, so, uh, so that's, uh, that's fun too. Um, and yeah, I'll be around. I got some, some, um, uh, book conference, uh, some writers conferences coming on, uh, coming up, uh, in uh, the Pennsylvania area. So, uh, you know, I'll keep everybody in touch on that. So, oh, very cool. so yeah, fun to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You'd be doing some signings and all that. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The right. pen writers in Lancaster. And uh, Greater Lehigh Valley Writers Group um, here, and it's like the Bethlehem Allentown area. So you know, those are always, spring is always a good time for uh, for conferences and sales and that kind of thing. So great, fun stuff. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you, thank you so much for joining joining. Yeah, yeah, thank you, oh, Del, sure. for sticking with so me. Far. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a blast. Yeah, it's gonna be great. I hope everybody enjoys this, and um, hopefully, um. We get more people joining us on the live Zoom in future episodes. That'll be a lot of fun. We can have you know additional comments and stuff. And be a blast. Sure, sure. Do a little bit more, you know, intro with social media next time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Once now that we get rolling. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody that's watching on Facebook and whoever's going to be watching on YouTube, I'll post this up on YouTube, I think. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> and then we'll be back next month with Waxing On with Ralph Macchio. Ooh, maybe I'll try reaching out to him and see if he'll hop on. <laughs> oh, that'd be nice. Let me know. Yeah. Yeah. Let, me, let me know how that goes, he's, Paul. He's from Long Island, too. I've been waiting two years to hear back from Andrew McCarthy, but we'll see. <laughs> never say never. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you so much, shot. everybody. <laughs> All right. Sure. Thanks a lot. Bye, right, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye.